Hi, my name is Joe Cernick. I'm a member of the faculty here at Lindenwood University, and I'd like to welcome you to Insight. Normally, uh, our Insight shows discuss books on politics, domestically, internationally, sometimes historical insights into the present, sometimes broader atmospheric or trend analysis books that provide a way of understanding broader developments. Today, we're not talking about a book on politics, but a book written by an FBI profiler uh, who covered serial murderers. And so the book is written by John Douglas and Mark Olshaker. John Douglas is the main author. Uh, and the book is titled The Anatomy of Motive, the FBI's Legendary Mindhunter Explores the Key to Understanding and Catching Violent Criminals. Now, joining me on the show today is a Lindenwood student, uh, Allison Kinster. So before we jump into a discussion about the book, I wanted to read an opening quote. The authors write, behavior reflects personality. If you've studied the criminal section of the population as long and as intensely as I have, you come to realize that even though every crime is unique, behavior fits into certain patterns. If you've seen enough and experienced enough to be able to pick out the significant pieces of those patterns, then you can begin to figure out what's going on and, more important, answer the question, why? That then should lead to the ultimate answer, who? Okay. So, like you kind of brought up already, the equation that's kind of discussed over and over again is why plus how equals who mm -hmm. and he kind of bases that's how he profiles his people as he tries to figure out why they do it how they do it and he tells people that if you can figure out those two things eventually you can find out who actually committed the crime itself based on those factors he does a really good job in the intro kind of giving you the background knowledge that you kind of need to know the difference between a serial killer spree killer mass killer which i felt was pretty important to know because eventually in the book he kind of talks a little bit about the serial killers he talks about charles whitman uh... later in the book which was a spree killer and everything like that so it was really nice to have the intro to kind of give me a little bit more background information that i didn't previously know yeah, he started the book, uh, was an outgrowth when he was, he was saying I'm on an English TV station, mm -hmm. and that when he finished being interviewed, uh, they asked him to stay to talk about uh, uh, killings that mm -hmm. had just taken place. It was at a place called Dunblame Primary mm -hmm. School, and somebody went into the school and uh, shot a lot of children. And so then uh, he's explaining to the TV audience that uh, this is this spree killing or serial killing and then he's trying to explain the type of person that would be motivated to do this and that there are these differences between how you might look at a serial killer uh, as being social not necessarily a spree killer who might be antisocial. And so he goes into a lot of depth and I think it's important to point out to the TV audience where does he get all this background. Well, he had permission to interview in prison uh, a number of very well-known serial killers. One of them was Son of Sam, uh, another one was Charles Manson, mm -hmm. and so he goes down the list of all these people that he had interviewed, and from these interviews he's able to start to develop some sort of a profiling technique. Uh, exactly, and he also goes in to talk about how every crime has a motive, and when he interviewed all of these uh, previous killers that were behind bars currently, he tried to figure out what was their motive and how they developed into the serial killer that they came to be, such as like their personal information, the evolution of their, their murders or their crimes in general. And he talks a lot about how it, it's kind of like a level. It's a graduation in a way. He starts at, they say, voyeurism and being a peeping Tom, and then maybe he'll go to like burglary and eventually work his way up to the major crimes such as the murders or raping or sexual assaults and stuff like that. So it was really cool how he showed you the step-by-step -step process of who you should kind of be wary with and who you should pay attention to at a young age because he says that almost all people that end up going on to be a murderer of some sort show some signs at a younger age. Yeah, he um, this notion of graduating to higher levels mm -hmm. of uh, committing crime, he had a quote here, uh, 
Uh, all too often, police uh, often dismiss panty thieves or fetish burglars or nuisance offenders. And all too often, they're not. And so then he goes on how they graduate to higher levels of crime and that uh, as a result, and I guess he's talking he and mm -hmm. all males in here. Uh, that you're developing this sort of higher level and how you constantly work your way up then don't feel satisfied with what you were doing. I feel like that was really a good point too. He went on to explain several times why he always just basically talked about men for the most part because he explained that women typically don't behave in this way and it's very rare that a woman would um, commit these crimes in the first place and it was hard for him to um, not necessarily think of an example of a woman that has done these kind of things, but he kind of basically just talked about the men he know, has known of because they're the ones that are most likely going to commit these crimes. This quote I uh, says, uh, it was sometime early in 1978 when it occurred to me that the only way to figure out what had happened at any crime scene was to one, understand what had gone on inside the head of the principal actor in that drama, the offender. And the only way to find that out so we could apply knowledge to other crime scenes was to ask them. Amazingly, with all the research that had been done in criminology, no one had attempted that before in any way that was more than casual and haphazard. I feel like going off of that, I know several times he talked about this in another book that I've read mm -hmm. um, about the BTK killer, that if you want to find out the meaning behind the art, go straight to the artist. And that's kind of how he was explaining that he knows all of these things because, like you had mentioned prior, he went and sat down with, I think he said, around like 38 of the celebrity murderers, like you said, Son of Sam, David Berkowitz, and the big ones that you see today that are still talked about that are so infamous in a way. Yeah, I, um, uh, I think that when I was going through this book, uh, that when he talks about sort of how you're actually seeing the police sort of communicate with who they want to talk to, so that some of the book wasn't always sort of a profile from the idea, we're going to tell you precisely how to catch them, but you get this feeling of, okay, now... Uh, there's the media, it's mm -hmm. TV or radio. How exactly should you think about actually you as the mm -hmm. police communicating then hoping that whoever that murderer is out there might be hearing what it is you're saying, but how do you want to do that? A lot of the times he discussed that the best way to get these so-called so uh, celebrity murderers to come out and finally be able to catch them as you had to flush them out by stroking their ego because in their mind this is the best thing that they've ever done in their life this is great this is the high point in their life if you want to call it their peak mm. so they want you to basically commend them on what they've done and tell them that not that they've done a good job but kind of make them more famous so that more people know about them so that they kind of get comfortable in the media and then will eventually kind of frame themselves and come on out. When uh, he was talking about Son of Sam in here, and I remember those uh, killings in uh, New York that was in the 1970s, and um, two of the things they were sort of uh, one night I came home late from work um, and I remember I saw police uh, at a car uh, down the block and it turned out to be one of his killings because I could tell that the back window had, and I was thinking it was breaking and entering, I wasn't thinking in terms that it was a shooting, uh, but then it was uh, one of some, Son of Sam's killings. And then uh, at that time I was uh, putting myself through grad school working in a bar in New York, you, the bars closed late. I don't remember whether it was three or four in the morning, but I remember driving home there were lots of cops that were undercover, planes closed, that would drive up and down roads. And I remember frequently um, there would be cars that would pull up and they'd stare at me. And I, I realized after a while there were police trying to figure out they'd pick anybody that was a guy in a car alone late at night to see if they could somehow uh, rattle them and maybe... I guess that was the way they try to do it, but uh, it was sort of an odd thing the first time I saw these this car pull up next to me and they were staring so strongly at me and then I, I knew what it was related to. 
but uh, so yeah, when he talked about Son of Sam in here, I remember those killings. The interesting part about Son of Sam is that, like he said, he kind of graduated. He was originally an arson, and he would set nuisance fires, is what they called them, and um, he would basically just put them in like small trash cans or abandoned buildings, really anywhere, not necessarily where they could be controlled, but where they weren't hurting per se other people. Um, and then he would watch as the fire department came and it like turned into a sexually based crime because that's how he like got off per se, is mm -hmm. he would watch the, the firefighters come and then masturbate to that and eventually it turned into him murdering because the arson wasn't enough for him anymore so that's when he graduated which was cool because it tied it back to the beginning of the book yeah the uh, the notion of uh, sex in odd ways or yeah. a distorted one seemed like it weaved itself through the book and yeah. so uh... you you talk about uh... some of these guys masturbating and I think there was one section in there where they talked about one of them would, was having sex with a chicken. And, you know, well, they don't say how, but, but apparently the police came upon it. Uh, and I guess they looked in his car thinking, I guess he was, you know, the two guy and a girl making out on the side of the road. Instead, it was some guy with a chicken. Well, I think what they said is that at first they stopped a guy and a girl and they were like, you guys need to move along and stuff like that. And they're like, why are you stopping us? So we pulled up on a guy that was having sex with a chicken. And sure enough, the cops went down the road and they found the guy and he was videotaping it. So, and then if you watch the video, supposedly um, John Douglas had watched it and he said that the guy, like, it wasn't that he was enjoying a chicken. He thought he was forcefully having sex with a woman and was basically essentially raping this chicken thinking it was raping a woman and and you see uh, yeah discussion of sex weaving itself mm -hmm. through so much of the serial killing over and uh, over and again. it's like yeah over and over and it's uh, something i guess that you, know, you don't consciously think about but uh, i and i guess that came through in a number of these interviews that he had uh, certainly the david horowitz one stood out who was the son of sam uh, killer uh, but then others too and so when he starts talking about him it seems like it's sex overlays and it's about control and manipulation it was all about the fantasy. I don't remember whether it was in this book or the other book I've read by him, but he talked about how the fantasy always came before the action. So all of these men were having these sexual fantasies, so all of these crimes that they were committing, even though for most people they'd sit here and think, this is absolutely heinous, like how can anyone first off do this in the first place, but find this sexually arousing in the second place. And if you read through these interviews that he had talked about with them over and over again, like you said, they all said that this was their way of like, hitting their peak and this is what they felt was the best sexual arousal for them which is just very disturbing the uh, one of the guys he interviewed this guy ed kemper he said was over uh, six foot nine weighed more than 300 pounds i i was wondering why they didn't have him sort of chained to a seat something. or something because the guy uh, is telling him as he's sitting there and uh, being interviewed by uh, this FBI profiler, John Douglas, that he's saying, well, you know, I can stand up and snap your neck, and all that's going to happen is since I have a wife in prison, they're just going to take away my dessert. So, yeah, and so he was referring to the, this in the book and this conversation, and so I was thinking, uh, I'm assuming then that many of these conversations, they were just people in a room and that there wasn't any protection against any sort of violent attack that might occur. Well, what I thought was interesting going off of that is like, I can see why they necessarily didn't have him chained down uh, because I know that they were trying to, I guess, make the criminals comfortable so that they were would be more likely to talk and discuss their crimes. Um, but that's even one of the notes that he had put in there was not necessarily about them needing to be chained up or anything, even when they do make comments like that. It was you had to pretend to not be appalled. Mm -hmm. So when someone would say something like that, he had to just take it with a grain of salt and act like it really wasn't that big of a deal. But when he called it his dessert, like that should have been a sure sign of these people are actually very mentally deranged. He uh, also went on that uh, he said one of the things he was discovering was eye contact and no eye contact. <laughs> and so he could break people down into different categories. So he said that uh, when he was talking with uh, Charles Manson, for example, 
that uh, Charles Manson uh, would look at him and stare, but other people wouldn't. So that you're looking at the notion of how you sort of realize, okay, am I looking at them and allowing them and we're having a conversation, or are we sort of, I'm not looking, but letting them talk. So he points some of that out in the book. That's truly, it, there's a lot of it that he discusses about how he broke it down, and I think a lot of it showed with, like, the eye contact and stuff like that, who were the ones that were more... Uh, controlling and felt like they were the superior killer is what he called them but then they're, they're also the type that were the inadequate killers who killed and tried to exert this power on these people because he felt in his own heart that he wasn't good enough and could not essentially have real relationships with people in general without trying to dominate them like that. David Horowitz who was son of Sam he says David Horowitz was born illegitimate and mm -hmm. told by his adoptive parents that his mother died giving birth to him. He mm -hmm. always felt guilty and responsible. When he later learned his birth mother and sister were alive, he went to see them and found out they wanted nothing to do with him. And so as a result, uh, this sort of, again, how you're tracing sort of certain uh, behavior types back to a very young age. Yeah, that was his, I guess, trigger point because obviously he still had um, a lot of issues because they said originally when he felt, when he thought that his mom had passed away during birth, he felt genuinely bad and thought it was his fault. And yes, that probably takes a toll on him, but when he found out that really wasn't the case and truly that they didn't want him, I think that was like the, oh, wow, I really am inadequate. Like, it's not that she had passed away. She really just didn't want me. And then he also went back and talked about another person back before they had committed these crimes. Is In their early life, they were divorced. His parents, well, he was raised by his grandparents because his mother couldn't take care of them. But then the parents divorced, and then he, like, had to get suspended from school multiple times. And then the grandpa, he was raised by his grandma once they got divorced. So he had no male role model. And he says that just simple things like that, obviously on its own, isn't going to create an issue. But if they already have some of these psychological issues, adding to it by things like that is just going to completely break them down even more. This was a quote I like. It said... Uh that you're looking at the idea that most convicted sexual predators had relatively high IQs, much mm -hmm. higher than you would expect to find in the general criminal population. And I think maybe that's uh, part of the reason why they could organize and sort of learn how to kill and learn from mistakes so that it made it uh, difficult to uh, eventually catch them. Yeah, when I was looking at that, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I'm pretty sure he said that the average, well, all serial killers fell between a 105 and like a 140, I want to think. Mm. Um, and then he said that the actual average was between a 115 and a 120, and the mm. average for the normal human population is only 100. Mm. So it shows just how sophisticated these serial killers really are. And that's why some of them, like the BTK K killer got away with so much that he did is because not only was he lucky in everything he did, but he could sit down and plan and organize all of these things within himself and then take out the acts. So he was technically like an organized because he discussed how there's unorganized killers yeah. and organized ones and it broke it down completely in another way, which it shows how much there really is to look at when you're trying to profile any kind of criminal, let alone a serial murderer. Yeah, the quote here, another one I like, most violent offenders we found uh, after some study had two factors warring inside them. One was a feeling of superiority, grandiosity. Uh, the other equally strong feeling was of inadequacy, of not being able to measure up, of knowing they were losers no matter what they did. So he was seeing this sort of fighting that was going on. You were trying to think of yourself as superior, but then at the same time you were sort of addressing your own inadequacies. I feel like the really sick ones that we talk about the most, like the Son of Sam and BTK, a lot of them it comes down to um, really that they're the ones that feel inadequate. But I feel like if you look at Charles Manson, he seems to be the ones that th thinks he's superior because he was able to kind of teach these people to commit his crimes for him. And it just shows how much power he feels he truly has. He said, uh, what motivates many, if not most of these guys, then is a desire for power and control mm -hmm. that comes from a background where they felt powerless and out of control. And then you see reference constantly in the book to the idea that uh, this is sort of what they're feeling is they are in control mm -hmm. at that particular moment. 
he talks about how he, they all, like you said, want to control, dominate, but also manipulate. He's trying to manipulate not only the people he's committing the crimes on, but the crime itself and himself as, as well. Um, I thought one thing that I completely skipped by that I felt was really interesting to me is that there's three youthful behaviors mm. that almost all um, criminals have, and it's called a homicide, homicidal triad. And it's got the bedwetting beyond a normal age. So obviously, if they're young still, it's not really that big of a deal. But that fire starting and arson and then the cruelty to animals or smaller children and he said if a kid does it at a young age and it's only one of them and he grows out of it then you shouldn't be worried but if they do two together or even all three of them then yeah. they really need to be looked into so that maybe we can prevent all of these criminals in the long run because when he did interview them he found out that a lot of them had if not two to three of these issues in the yeah. homicidal triad. Yeah, the uh, harming of animals oh, certainly yeah. stood out because then you were killing, but nobody paid attention mm -hmm. because it was an animal. Yeah, and no and one so, even realized they were yeah. murdered in a way. Yeah, he goes on, he said, through the interviews, we were discovering patterns of behavior. Again, sorry, very mm -hmm. much like the quote I read. We found that men we studied seemed to realize early on, sometimes even at a very young age, that the power to manipulate others gave them a sense of control, and they felt so lacking of that in their own lives. And so this was that moment where they could control everything. Exactly. A lot of them, they said that the fantasies are better than the kill itself because in the fantasies, nothing can go wrong. He's basically setting up everything he wants to happen and how he wants to have it, have it happen, and no one's necessarily going to act out of his fantasy. But in real life, when he goes to commit these crimes, a lot of them, when they have to improvise because someone does something that they didn't expect, the, the kill isn't as exciting as the fantasy. Yeah. So it kind of then... I guess it goes in a circle of then he's going to fantasize a little bit more, but then the fantasies aren't going to be enough anymore. And like I said earlier, a lot of them tie back to all their sexual arousal and needs. Well, again, he uses this term sexual fantasy, mm -hmm. but then he says sexual fantasy not as in normal sexual fantasy, mm -hmm. but arson and bombings were considered sexual fantasies. So then they're building on, on that. And so he says, as a result, it isn't like you're looking at a normal sexual mm -hmm. fantasy. It's their definition of how they end up seeing this. And so, uh, again, what you're doing is he's trying to, uh, and again, I think the other thing I, I thought was interesting, we even through that book, is coming back to how to, here's telling the police, here's how we want you to talk in front mm -hmm. of the TV cameras. Here's how we want you to talk mm -hmm. on radio and that as a result this is this attempt to try to draw some of them, them out. Mm -hmm. I thought what was really cool though is in each chapter he basically kind of go into a different crime area if that makes sense. Like so it, one yeah. whole chapter was dedicated to all about arsonry and stuff like that um, and he went and actually talked about um, one guy, I believe his name was Paul Keller, mm -hmm. and he was this huge arsonist that they couldn't find for a very long time. He was setting these huge fires, and it eventually led to where he was building, uh, burning down buildings that had people inside of them. And he, I don't think he was ever caught with, yes, he was. At first, they, didn't, they couldn't prove that he was the one that burnt down the, um, I believe it was a retirement home right. or something yeah. along those lines, and they, eventually they tied that to him as well. But they looked back at his past, and the one thing that was very interesting is although he felt inadequate and that his life was crumbling around him, his marriage was failing, and then everything like that, and he had, I believe he had just lost a couple of jobs, and now he was working for yeah. his parents, but even struggling there, his parents were decently good to him, is what it seemed anyways, and that his other two siblings grew up normal like any other child technically would. So it was really interesting to see that his own parents like went through his life and said like this is what how everything was, and eventually, um, his dad turned him in and then took the reward money and then donated it back to one of the churches he had previously burnt down so that they could rebuild. So it kind of showed that the dad really didn't necessarily raise him wrong, that it was something within the killer. But then Douglas always goes back and says, I don't think anyone's born a killer. I think someone is always kind of not made a killer, but has these attributes that can be all added up if they're not looked into prior. I uh, thought on the Son of Sam when David oh, Berkowitz said he said he set more than 2,000 fires in New York City 
which was, uh, boy, you're trying to think, uh, trying to count, well, okay, let's say you got 365 days in a year times, how, you know, how many, and so how long was this, how long was he doing this? Mm -hmm. And so that as a result, you're trying to sit down and figure out this. And so in each case, though, like her, which you're sort of saying, okay, you've had enough, and it isn't enough of a thrill, mm -hmm. so now you're going to uh, elevate or graduate to that next level, which is to start to kill people. The really interesting thing was not only, like I said, they called, the cops call him a nuisance ar uh, arsonist, but in Douglas's eyes, they call him a fetish arsonist because this is like a sexual fetish for them, for especially Berkowitz in general. But then um, the Paul Keller story, they were saying that he would light one fire in one place, he would listen to the police scanner, and then hear them all get dispatched to that area, and then go set one in a different place, and then wait till they got dispatched, and basically just lead them in circles. Mm -hmm. And basically was just trying to cause as much of a disturbance as possible. He wasn't just lighting one per time and watching it burn. He was getting one lit and then moving to the next position so that he could start more. He goes, what's happening is that he's getting caught up in the media, starting mm -hmm. to believe in his own power, a power that in every other aspect of life he completely lacks. And mm -hmm. so then he goes on with the whole notion of uh, why it is that you want to present them uh, to the public in such a certain way. Uh, and as a result, you're not talking to the public at large, but to one individual. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I also thought was interesting, I don't remember where I read it at in the book, but there was one time when he said maybe it's their feeling of being a human torch. So he, they called themselves a human torch because they were lighting everything and anything on fire that they wanted to. They felt that's where all their power was coming from. And like we had addressed earlier, um, maybe if Paul Keller eventually didn't get caught, if he wasn't finally released to the media with the sketch that they had tried to build and everything like that, maybe he would have graduated to the next level of crime. Yeah, the Paul Keller situation, he was trying to figure out where something in his childhood might have begun. And interestingly, he, they were trying to say, I wonder if it was related to a detached umbilical cord, which oh, is yeah, really going back. And so you're thinking, what? Uh, and so from that, he needed certain treatments mm -hmm. in the hospital and whether or not that might have been a cause and a later effect. Yeah, that was very interesting. I totally forgot that that was even part of it because I feel like I kind of got lost in I guess the beginning the actual like I want to say like childhood not the yeah. birth or bas basically being a baby if that makes sense. We only have a moment left what you think of the book? I, I really loved it I think it was very interesting it was very easy to read very hard to put down um, if anyone's even interested in kind of learning about any of this or has any seem to want to learn about any of this um, it's definitely a book to read. Yeah okay it was a good book, I agree. I think you'll enjoy reading it. It's a quick read, and it certainly gives you some insight, not into just killers, but how FBI profiling actually takes place. Thank you for joining us today.